Ladies and gentlemen, we before we start this episode, there's uh, there's something we need to address. I'm going to throw you over to my co-host, Benjamin J. Parrish, for a, a formal apology and some some notes about that apology. Ben, uh, Ben's coming to us live from Arizona. Ben, uh, over to you. Hello, Sam. Great to be here today. Uh, yes, I Glad again, to have you. Um, thank you so much for having me on. Just a little bit before we get the episode started here today. Last week... In the episode, we were talking a lot of great stuff about Huey Lewis in the news, about, uh, I don't know, probably Dr- Danny Trejo, who knows, um, about yeah. shark magic. Uh, yep. one, one thing I did mention, and I realized while I was going back through the episode, is that I said that Weird Al had never done a parody directly of a Huey Lewis in the news song, and... You know, we we build ourselves up here to be you know, the heights of integrity, and I was wrong. He, of course, has done a Huey Lewis in the News song because he's pretty much done everyone's song. Um, he's done a parody of "I Want a New Drug" by Huey Lewis in the News, a, a by real Huey banger, Lewis, yes, a real banger by anyone's estimations. You know, you know the song. We all <clears> know the song. I want a new drug. One that won't make me sick, you know, you know, Sam. I do know. Yes, I. That's it's on my playlist of top number ones by Huey Lewis in the news. Oh, it it is a top number one by Huey Lewis in the news. It's right up there with the Ghostbusters theme. But going on, yep. yes, it is. Um, I I just wanted to apologize because you know there's really there's actually in in all truthfulness there's really no one that I want to disappoint less than Brandon Sanderson and Weird Al Yankovic and I feel like I both I let them both down in that moment yeah. um, and yeah. Huey you know Huey Lewis if if he wants if he's listening in I, I'm sorry your your songs are ex- incredibly worthy of being parodied and that's why Weird Al did it and he's the he's the king he's the king well Ben uh, th- that was yeah, there was something else you wanted to do because apology yeah. is great. Don't get me wrong, lying is not a it's not a good thing. Lying no one stinks. lies. It stinks. On, on on it stinks. It it's physically bad. smells. No one lies to people it. they love. Mm-hmm. It does, and you know, with the Sander fanatics, there's a uh, th- you can't just say sorry. You gotta do a little something extra. So Ben, what do you got? That's a little extra to make up for it. I just want to read an apology, the lyrics to "I Want a New Duck" by Weird Al Yankovic. We won't play the music because, you know, I know Weird Al wants people to go out and, and, and search for this song on their own. But uh, I'm just going to read some yes. of the lyrics that some of the beautiful lyrics that he made to go over Huey Lewis's club banger. Um, I want a new duck. One that won't try to bite. Won't One that won't chew a hole in my socks. One that won't quack all night. I want a new duck. One with big web feet. One that knows how to wash my car and keep his room real neat. One that won't raid the icebox. One that'll stay in shape. One that's never going to try to migrate or escape. Or I'll tie him up with duct tape. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now let's get this rockin'. Hey everybody, thank you for listening to Brandon Sander Fans with Ben and Sam. I'm Ben. Nope, I'm Sam with my co-host, Ben. Co-host and best friend, Ben. Man, I nailed this opening, Ben. How are you? (laughs) It's a good thing we picked you to do this opening, Sam. I'm doing great. (laughs) My name is also Sam, and uh, it's a great week to be a Sander fanatic. It is. And you know, hey, Sander fanatics, how are you? I don't think we asked that enough. You guys doing good? Hope everyone's, hope everyone's had a great week. I hope uh-huh. everyone is uh, succeeding in school, work, or the Olympics. Yeah, this episode's coming out in four years, so it's going to be uh, very topical. <laughs> it's it's going to fit right in time with the Olympics. 
just at the same time the Olympics are. Um, Sam, do you know when the, when the next Olympics are and, and where they're taking uh, place? Yes, we just had them <clears throat> in uh, sunny Florida, and we will be having them in less sunny Beijing. Oh, wonderful. I, I do see that the 2018 Winter Olympics are going to be in Pyeongchang. You, there were, here's the crazy thing. Uh, what? I, f- I forgot that there were Winter Olympics. That's the crazy thing. So, in, <laughs> so, so luckily for all you guys, this is only coming out a year later than we, than we thought it was. So that's, that's good news for everybody. I, you know, bad news, good news, bad news about this. Like, you know, not everyone remembers the Winter Olympics. Um, but Sam apparently also forgot that Cool Runnings existed uh, because it's based all around the Winter Olympics. Um, and Eddie the Eagle, which just came out, that's another underdog story that Sam forgot about. I, now, that one I, I can honestly say I did forget about because I've never seen it. But I did watch Cool Runnings six days ago. Very enjoyable film. Uh, and, and within I, five, those six days, five, you five, have five, forgotten five. that the Winter Olympics existed. Yeah, yes, that is correct. These allegations are true. I stepped down <laughs> from my post as Winter Olympics coordinator for Winter Olympics. <laughs> That's going to look bad finally, on your resume, but you it know, will, it's, it's but better can, that you that you own up to it right now. I can finally pursue my hobby of putting putting little bobsleds in glass bottles. That's uh, well, what I've always Sam, wanted to as, do with my life. As the Winter Olympics coordinator to the Winter Olympics, weren't you supposed to be in Pyongyang co- coordinating the Winter Olympics? So you really stepping down is just you kind of saying, oh, I meant to not be there coordinating the Winter Olympics. <laughs> well, they always they always try to get you there at least four to, two to four years in advance. Uh, and yeah. I'm a year late and I've got a ton of emails that I have not read through because uh-huh. I've been busy uh, binge watching things such as Who is not time? limited to uh not uh, you know i don't know am i really allowed to say tv shows on this show will we get sued i don't know sam you know we can reference things that are popular sometimes i, I know we oh, don't okay. normally do it we normally reference like west side story and and weird al songs that are on his like b-sides not even his main albums so yeah i think i think you're okay okay well i mean since this one isn't very popular i've uh, been binge watching uh parks and rec and scrubs so i mean those are pretty indie shows I, I don't really think anybody the point yeah, is I Pyong, I, Pyong I, I, Pang, I don't know what you're talking about i i don't know yeah, what those yeah. shows are they're german they're very uh <laughs> yeah, very unique this... but the point is i've got a ton of emails i gotta go through and i have to answer each and every one individually saying oops lol sorry i can't be there here's my replacement and i'll send them just i'll just send him a picture of steve buscemi they should be able to contact him he's got his information on the on the internet right you know you know uh, scarily enough they'll probably just hire a new duck they'll probably be like wait sam wasn't a duck i thought we hired a duck for this guys it's the winter olympics we we need it we need one that's not gonna that's not gonna migrate or try to escape it's not gonna escape or migrate (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) excuse me well uh ben what do we what is this uh what is this thing it's called a, a podcast is that correct yeah, it's a podcast. Um, oh, good. Uh, scarily good. enough, not one we can make uh, pop culture references on, but we can reference Brandon Sanderson. Uh, we read chapters 22 through 24. Um, and yeah, in these chapters, we get to see Vin interacting with the team some more. She's a lot more comfortable speaking with them and calling them her friends in her mind and in her heart and oh. in her under heart where she hides all her secret feelings. <gasps> That's where Reen lives. And he's just like, get out of here, feelings. Everyone's trying to betray you. Dang it, Reen. You know, yeah, everyone's, got under- a little, everyone's got a little Reen in their heart. And uh, the, the whole point of life is just to get rid of that Reen. We'll get to that. I think in the third book? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> but yeah, speaking with uh, with the people in the crew, she, she speaks with Spook. And Spook's like, hey, uh... Uh, how's it going? <laughs> and <No>. she's like, <laughs> and wasn't that how was it, how was? Or he he says, "Going how was it?" Is what it if no, he says. That was that was still far too intelligible. I needed to be more unintelligible. 
Oh. If you could just please uh, you know, it, it, speak he, this book. He says wasn't to the wind, was it? Wasn't it? <laughs> that was it. That was it. And then he and then he gives her a handkerchief. Um, which the first time I read it, I'm I always reference the first time I read it, everyone needs to get over it. Stop complaining. Laura. <laughs> But the first time I read it, I was like, oh, this is obviously a sign of affection. It's pretty, I would think that it's pretty common knowledge that somebody gives you a handkerchief, a monogrammed handkerchief. Um, it, it, it does mean, you know, it's a sign of, I would very much like to court you, m'lady. Oh, uh-huh. gross. I hated, I hated that. I hated it so much. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's a little interesting. Like, I get that Vin, the, the ska, uh, the thief, wouldn't understand what the handkerchief meant. Um, yeah. She probably has just been paying very bad attention to Sazed that uh, she doesn't know that that's what, like, noble people do. Because I'm sure that it was somewhere in her lessons and she just didn't pay attention to it. Or she ran away or she steel jumped away. Because uh, she's, think... she's leading this little boy on and she's like, he's just yeah, a little yeah, boy. Yeah. And it's like, he's like one year younger than you. You're 16. You're like, you're a little girl. And then she's like, yeah, but I wear dr- I wear dresses, and I go to balls, and I'm fancy. That makes her 38 in fancy years. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, in, she was also reading in the in the uh, logbook um, yes. about, like, terrorist men and what they can do. And so she confronts Sazed, and she's like, oh, yeah, well, Kelsey told me, like, everything about terrorist men, so you might as well just tell me all the things about terrorist men. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> With just she that she definitely same plays that card sometime. Yeah, she she plays that card sometimes, like where she acts like she knows more than she does uh, to get information she absolutely does not have, and uh, and then uh, he gives her an explanation of uh, Furukami that there's only the keepers can do it. They can store knowledge, they can store strength, they can store other attributes like speed, and uh, and, and and then uh, pull on them later. Yeah. And as we see several times, or at least as Vin points out several times, she'll see Sazed reading with glasses and without glasses, uh, which he obviously is part of his for, for, uh, Farukamical, no, Farukamic abilities. Uh-huh. Uh, and to uh, obviously he used that to be able to see Vin when he saved her that night, um, and then uh, for other practical uses or, or uses that are important to whatever Sazed's doing. But Farukami is such... That is such a cool magic system that he's created, and we learn uh, we learn more about it in this chat or in these chapters as well as the chapters and books to come. But it's uh-huh. it is it is just as cool, if not like, like a little bit cooler than Alamancy, in my opinion. It has got some yeah. super cool benefits as well as some you know it's got dental and it's got vision. It's got all <laughs> of them. it's got all the benefits. But it is such a great you, magic system. That you can Brent store teeth. <laughs> you can store teeth, so when your teeth get knocked out, you just grow more teeth. You just, you that's all you do. <laughs> you, like you st- this, this, this ring, this metal mind. Yeah, that's for teeth. This one's for eyeballs. I lose those all the time. This one's for fingers, <laughs> oddly enough. So I hope maybe I should move that to a toe or something. Um, <laughs> Oh, can you just imagine? You can just imagine that Saza takes off his shoes and he's just got tons of toe rings. I know they're practical, but it's just like dated and a little tacky. I'm just like, come on, man. That's why you don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> he... <laughs> he had a surgery that extended the length of his toes to right where the foot bends, and so to... he just has like a heel and then a just weird finger toes covered in oh my hundreds, gosh, that's hundreds of rings. It is. It's, it's nightmare, nightmare stuff. But you know, he'll spend a week without. Uh, he'll spend a year without enamel on his teeth, and then after a year, he'll put it back in or put it back on, and then he'll just have the strongest teeth. He could bite through dirt, not dirt, rocks. He could bite through rocks and be like, "Look what I found in here! More toe rings." It Furukami has got cool stuff. I was surfing the internet the other day, and I saw one of those ads on the side of a, of a webpage, and it said, dentists hate him. Find out why. And there's a picture of Sawzed right there. I'm like, oh. And I clicked, I clicked, and it was just a copy of Mistborn. <laughs> was it one of those copies that, like, destroys itself after a couple hours, so you have to read it as fast as you can? Well, yeah, because, you know, the dentists get to it. Because uh, they hate him. Yeah, they shut it down. The gyms hate him. 
because he can get he can get swollen a sec for a sec. <laughs> and it's called the the association is called the Dentists Against Brandon Sanderson Dabs, and they do they they can't stand him. Anytime he has a book signing, they're protesting with their giant yeah, picket it, signs that look like teeth. With their giant picket signs and they're dabbing, they just dab all the time outside. <laughs> they're just out there. And, 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 you know, the, the worst part is they do knock out a lot of each other's teeth just dabbing, but they're right there and getting, getting the teeth put back in. Like that's, that's basically the dentists are just like making teeth automatons out there. Yeah. And I don't know what they're, what they're complaining about because people walk by and they see this and they're like, these are some pretty good dentists. I wonder where they go or wonder where they work. And then they just get a bunch of new clients. Uh huh. Dentists, dentists are crazy, man. But you know who's not crazy? Sazed. He ain't crazy. Yeah. He's, he's not he's crazy. Rings. He's never dabbed. He's... <laughs> he has a metal mine just for dabbing. He can store all his dabs in there. He can store all his dabs. Day, and then he does a super dab him. one day. It's all, all the potential dabs that he could have ever done. And then one day he just does a super dab. And it's just so right. So nice. So choice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Sorry we spoiled the ending of the series, you guys. That's how it all Sorry. ends. Sorry. Lord Ruler, I, I won't take this anymore. In front of all these people, I'm going to show you who's the bomb. And he starts to dance. And Lord Ruler's like, oh no, you, you can't beat this. And the Lord Ruler starts to dance. Ro- Lord Ruler, he's very good because he's got those old style moves. He's been alive for a thousand years. Oh, and yeah. so he's just oh, yeah. been he's just been practicing in that little hut mm-hmm. inside of his house. Uh, <laughs> listening, to, listening to lots of uh, lots of the death metal urchin band um, and and but then he looks over it right at Saza just so right brings one hand up to his face and one hand out and then taps all of it all of his dab mind all and of just, his dab mind all of his dab mind it just dabs so right that like the lord ruler just cries he cries until he dies he just cries and cries until he melts and that's how it now ends the- <laughs> the Hero of Ages was originally written as uh, uh-huh. the Dab of Ages, uh-huh. but uh, he, Brandon was so ahead of his time with said dabbing that he's like, you know what? I, people aren't really going to get it. I'm just going to call it the Hero of Ages. That's the, that was the fourth title I wanted, but that's fine. It's fine. Well, it's but, whatever. Let's by just, that let's time, just see how the, it goes. the dentist against Brandon Sanderson had gotten really, really big, and he didn't want to give him any more traction, I think. So I that, think absolutely. he moved away from dabs a little bit more in future books. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's a little history of Furukami. Uh, uh-huh. Mainly focused around toe rings and dabbing. Exactly. <laughs> and around <laughs> weird toe augmentations, apparently. Um, <laughs> then Van goes and talks to Doxin. So we get, like, our first Doxin talk. Our first Dox- yeah. Doxin Toxin in, in, to- in the toxin. book. Uh-huh. And uh, she asks him, like, hey, wh- wh- why are you here? guy but except not in a bad way um and he he talks a little bit about his history that he used to live on a plantation and that he loved a girl and you know normal plantation stuff that you know her his nobleman wasn't as bad as most and then he took his girl and he raped and killed her you know, just and he's and he's just saying it matter of factly, like that's just how it happens out there. There's and that's what we're fighting to change. And she's like, Well, not all noblemen are like that and it kinda of sets him off. He's he's like, Are you kidding me? Like everything that I've worked for is because these people are evil. Every single one of them does this. He explains that in brothels inside the city, ska women that are there uh, if they are, if they're with a nobleman, then they're killed like immediately. They're just basically bought and sold as as fodder for that, and that ska women don't even count sleeping with or uh, noble women don't even count sleeping with a ska woman as cheating because they're not even human. They're not even things anymore. Yeah, this was such a. It was a. It was a. I shouldn't say it was a small moment with Doxin because there was a lot learned and there was a lot of a lot of heavy heavy talk, but. It was it was another look inside the world of, of noblemen because he's like, yeah, my plantation owner wasn't as bad as others, but he still, you know, killed and he still raped and he still beat Ska to death. But, you know, a Ska, a, a, a nobleman could do this horrible thing, but then the next day be praised as, you know, a moral upstanding person in the eyes of others. And mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a twisted double double standard 
world that the noblemen in which the noblemen live but to them it's just like whatever you know we we do this because you know we're the ones with the money and we're the ones who can do it so mm-hmm. we're going to keep doing it and uh, you know with Vin trying to defend and in reality what she, who she's trying to defend is Ellen because of her feelings for him mm-hmm. uh, but you know Doxon and Kelsier do have a point in that noblemen the noblemen in this world have been raised in such a way in such a, a misogynistic and in such a, a violent way that they're not they're not going to change anytime soon and forgive me for jumping ahead but uh, mm-hmm. th- there's a, a little meeting between Ellen and some of his friends yeah. uh, kind of like I, I hate to I hate to draw this similarity or at least say that it's similar but a little bit like the the students in Les Mis uh, where they you know like we're going to make a better world and we have all the now- knowledge now because we're young and we're full of moxie. Yeah. But it, we, we you know, know the, so much better. Everything's is... going to be different when we're, yeah. when we're around. Not when I'm yeah, in charge, yeah. I'm going to say. And how am I going to get there? I'm, I'm going to kill and murder and, and yeah, exactly. raise everything. And then I'm going to decide which morality we're going to follow. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's for amazing and incredible reasons, like the start of a brand new nation. Um, or what they were going for in Les Mis, but um, sometimes it's ill-advised and, and it doesn't work out. And re- yeah, rarely does it end well for the people who were plotting to yeah. uh, to do it, even if they had the best intentions in the world, which in reality, Ellen and his friends do. You know, they want to steer away from this this corrupt and from this, this veritably evil world. Is veritably mm. a word? Oh gosh, I hope that's a word. But yeah, you know, it's, think, it's a world it that they... Something like that. Yeah, they, they want to change because they want to change the world because they know that this type of living this type of living isn't beneficial to anybody it's not beneficial to the ska and as as much as the the noblemen like to believe it's beneficial to them it's uh, it's not it's too uh it's too lavish of a lifestyle to mm. continue on for for any longer than it has yeah, it, well, and the thing is, it only works because the majority of human beings on that world are oppressed and slaves of the of the minority of just the yeah. few. And and it really it really bugs it, it it bugs Vin a lot because she argues with Doxon like, no, they're not all like that, and he's like, no, they are. All of them do this, and it shakes her to her core. Uh, his conviction and how she's been blinded uh, is so long, and she wants to talk to Ellen and basically ask him, like, "Hey, have you done this? How many how many scop women have you killed and slept with?" And she actually gets the opportunity to ask him that, and uh, it turns out he has participated in it, um, although a little tangentially. His father, who we know is kind of a a bunghole, he forced him to go and be a man by finally betting a girl. Um, and then he, he's like, I didn't know that they were going to kill her afterwards. I didn't know any of that. And I've never done it again uh, because now I'm stronger. Now I'm older and he can't force me to do those things. And so it it, a... it, it, it's kind of a weight off of Vin that she knows that yeah. it, it's, it's not just him. And she asks like, how many noblemen do this? Because she's looking around and she's basically framing everyone in this light. And he's like, I don't know, a third? Which is still crazy. That's, a, crazy. yeah. And so I, I think part of her concern as well, well, going back. So a third of the noblemen are, you know, having these sort of affairs uh, and uh, are basically complicit in the Ska's deaths. Uh, so how do you save a society like that? How does it sustain itself? It, it, that's that's why, you know, that I think as much as the Lord Ruler needs to go down, those people need to go down in, in the noble society as well, because that can't yeah. perpetuate into the new world if they're going to take down the Lord Ruler. Right, and that's when, uh, so this all, or at least, uh, Alan and his friends are talking, Vin is listening. Yeah. Uh, and mm-hmm. then Kelsier shows up, and she's like, Vin. And she's like, whoa, Kelsier, you're walking on walls like David Bowie. And he's like, I don't get that reference. <laughs> and then they go and talk for a second or two. It's pretty but freaky, man, but I don't get that reference. pretty freaky, man. But uh, Kelsier has a point. He's like, you know, it's it's harmless children talking philosophy. There's mm-hmm. really not much that these, these few kids can do. 
and which is or that they're going you know, to do they're basically just yeah. they're basically just making alliances making friends for the future because they're all going to be heads of their house and this is what right. always happens every generation and it's it's harmless for them to do that but it's also not going to lead it to anything yeah and we don't know much about the, the past history of noblemen but there's there's probably been a few noblemen who, in their the same age as Ellen, said to themselves, you know, I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm going to be something new. And then whether the lifestyle of it caught up with them or they just eventually gave up because they knew they couldn't do it and then mm-hmm. fell into what the noblemen are now or normal noblemen have been. And as as good as the intentions are of Ellen and his friends and even, uh, and even maybe possibly other noblemen we don't know, it's... Uh, it's it, it's got to be such a impossibly difficult thing to try to get out of to try to wean their way or wiggle their way out of mm-hmm. and uh it's you know good on them for wanting to um but the, it, at this rate there's there's not much they could do just the five or six of them i don't remember how many there were yeah it well it's not like they they don't have an army they don't have and yeah. and it doesn't seem like anyone other than Ellen is really super interested in the ska or their plight. Ellen's super into it, and the others are like, yeah, it's nice to talk about it, but it's, it seems really only Ellen is the one that would be prepared to dig in and actually make a change. Um, so yeah, that's, that's as much we learn there. It kind of vindicates Vin's feelings, though, that it's okay, that Ellen is actually okay. He's actually the, the one worth saving, at least, of the noble class. Um, and then they go back and they meet up with everyone at the bar, and Ham's back, uh, because Kelsey Yay. just came back from the from the caves. Ham's back, and uh, we, we settle the debate over how he gets his shirtless, her sleeveless shirts, and he, he rips off the sleeves himself, because he's actually wearing the uniform, the captain's uniform he was wearing for the uh, army. He just ripped off the sleeves, and now it's just wearing it. No, actually, <laughs> and what I think like, happened... Duxon's like, it's, it's so hard to get those, please don't do that, and he's like, too late, I'm, it's done. My, my arm's like, got to breathe, boy. <laughs> I, I, I flexed and they exploded. I cannot control this. Now, there was, uh, <laughs> there was one moment that I actually wrote it down in a notebook and then my two-year-old grabbed the notebook and I can't find it. Um, they're all... <laughs> Let me try to find it. Uh, if I can't, I remember at least what happened. But they're all sitting they're... there. Uh-huh. And, and... Uh, Breeze, Breeze says something to... I wish I could find Spook? it. Ah, I was so, Breeze, ah, I wrote it down. Breeze says something to Spook. I, I think I know the moment you're talking about. Breeze says something to Spook, and Spook responds in his street talk, and then Kelsey responds in street talk, and Hammett responds in street talk until Breeze just gets so frustrated that he like gets, uh, he like gets fed up with everyone and stops talking. Is that what you're talking about? It is. It's actually the very first time because Breeze is like. Uh, hey, uh, Spook, will you give me a little refreshment? And then Spook says something in Spook Talk, and uh-huh. Breeze says, "I do not understand. I do not understand what you said. Therefore, I'm going to ignore it and move on." And that was so <laughs> Lucille Bluth of Breeze that I had to put the book down and giggle for a minute because it reminded me of the episode where. They're at that restaurant, and the lady comes up and says, do you want the family platter or just the regular size? And then Lucille says, I don't understand the question, therefore I won't answer it. And I just had to (laughs) laugh so hard, because I knew that somewhere in uh, every universe there is at least one Lucille Bluth, and we found her. And Breeze Breeze is the Lucille Bluth. (laughs) And if you don't know a Lucille Bluth, it's probably because you're the Lucille Bluth. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, so the uh, the last little bit, or at least the last chapter. Is there anything else you want to bring up in that little section? Um, no, just uh, the the last little bit where she gets to go on uh, pewter lessons with Ham, and we get to learn more about Ham and, and what his what his situation is and what he does. Ham is such a cool guy. He is easily my favorite character, and of course, he is a shame that he's a, a secondary character and we don't see him as much as I would very much like to. But he's yeah. very cool. And, uh, and I don't want to say copycat of a character of other pewter like or pewter arm um, people, you know, whether in this, whether in other fiction or, or this universe, he is such a cool and unique person, mm. even for being because he's not really a meathead. You know, he's yeah, he's very muscly. He, it's like the, the he's like Channing Tatum with the head or at least the brain of a uh, 
I can do this. Hold up. With the brain of a philosophy student. There we go. Thanks. A, a philosopher. philosopher. <laughs> Sorry, my my eight month old is with me. He woke up from his nap and he's hitting me with mm-hmm. the car. Thanks, dude. But yes, ham oh, and then get to have a little pewter run. Or yeah. they hope to. <gasps> uh oh. Uh huh. I I love Ham too, and I totally agree with you. The the reason that he's so special, I think, is because he has such a different worldview than everyone else. Because he is the only one of them that we know of that's a father, and that's what yeah. basically he centers everything around. He's just trying. He he loves the, everyone in the crew. He wants them all to succeed. He wants everything to go well but the reason he's doing this stuff and sometimes it means pitting him against some people that he's made friends with and the reason he's willing to do that is so that he can have a good life for his wife and his kids um and it is kids i he has more than one child and uh, i scott women usually have more than one kid um mm-hmm. so i bet i bet he's got a whole gaggle of hamlings around just just running around <laughs> That he gets Hamlets. to go meet little little Hamlets uh, <laughs> that, that he can go meet, and they're just like, "How's it going, Dad?" Uh, I don't know. They're probably not all boys, but who are you kidding? They're they're all boys. Even if they're all girls, none of them have sleeves. I can tell you that. <laughs> I so I I really love Ham too, and the the way he treats other people, like he goes to the garrison and he's he has like sincere friends over there, like, "Hey, it's so nice to see you again," and. Like how's it going? And like he he feels a real kinship with with these guys. Maybe even more than a kinship with the people on the crew, because he understands where they're coming from. They're just trying to earn money for their families. So this is the this is the only thing they can do. All they can do is is fight. Um, it's almost like like Ham is trapped with the power of Pewter. Like he would rather have any other power. Like if he could be. Uh, if he could be a seeker, that'd be great. If he could burn tin, that'd be perfect. If he could burn bronze, he'd be happy protecting people. And maybe that's something that he likes about Pewter, but he doesn't really, it doesn't feel like he likes hitting or hurting people. I don't think we ever see him do that in in the series. We'll, we'll have to call it out if we do. Yeah, I was going to say, at least thus far, we've only heard talk. You know, like, the ham, he's, he's, a, he's a thug. No, not a thug. What do they call him? He's 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 a hit hit harder. He's a hard hitter, and he's and you know he's. I'm sure that he's very good at combat, which we almost get to see. He comes up, and as Ben mentions, he does have a lot of friends. You know, everyone, not everyone, but several people are like, "Ham, hey, it's good to see you." And then he goes, you know, to the guard, and he's like, "What's up, guys? Let's brawl." And they're like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, bro, we gotta go." But what I, what also what I think is really cool at the end of this or at the end of this uh, section that we read is that we learn. That an army revolted in the mountains and in the hills. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they were like, hey, Ham, uh, I would promote you like straight to captain. We could use a guy like you. That's how good his reputation is. That's how good of a pewter arm slash person he is. They were just like, look, we've, you know, we've either we've met before or worked together or fought together. Whatever it is, you're not you're not with us right now, but I would absolutely promote you and give you this position. We need someone that's as good as you at what you do. And that is such a that just shows the the leaps and bounds that he is that he's done in order to have such a strong integrity and have such a strong rapport with all these castle guards. I know you're so excited about it too. It's so exciting. <laughs> but that that leads to the end there because uh, they they get the notice that there is a ska army that's attacking one of their garrisons right out by where their ska army was hidden. And uh, they realize that their army is under attack, and they may lose everything right there. And that's where yep. the chapter ends. And we'll get we'll get into the aftermath of of or resolving the rest of that next week. Um, but for finishing up this episode today, um, uh, co-host and all, we're actually doing a uh, new segment uh, no. called Brandon Sandermans. It's where we make a new man's or woman's or human's to put into a Brandon Sanderson book. So since we're reading Mistborn, uh, we're going to be creating a new character and injecting them into the story, kind of injecting their their history and, and what they're doing in, in the story up to what we know so far. And the way we're going to be able to create this new character is we're going to uh, take three random words from this random word generator 
and we're going to uh, create the new character with these three words in mind. So I'm going to generate three random words here. All right. All right, Sam, the three random words uh, are affordable, hatchet, and aerobatic. Aerobatic? Aerobatic, yeah. I'm going to text what? this to you just so that you have... Okay. okay. Affordable right. hatchet um, aerobatic. Okay, I got I got some good ideas about this. Do you, uh, do you have anything you want to start with? Uh, I mean, I, I have an idea. So uh, what we're doing mm -hmm. is we're taking these three words and then creating kind of a, a small backstory for the character. Yeah, we're creating a backstory. We're creating a story for what they're doing, uh, what they've done before where we are in the story now, and then up to the point where they are in the story right now. Okay. You go first. Okay. So... This character that we're that we're creating is a coin shop, so they they can burn steel and do steel pushes, but only that they're missing. But they tell all of their friends that they're a mistborn, and I'm gonna say it's a nobleman uh, in a noble house, okay. and they've convinced okay. everyone just by clever handling, by uh, by uh, you know some espionage, some some uh, skullduggery, that they're actually a full Mistborn when all they can do is is uh, push um, metal away from them. So that's our aerobatic. What they do, they, they're really, really good at steel pushes. And so they do lots of tricks and flips and sweet, sweet stunts for all their friends. Like uh, uh, maybe they're like from minor noble house. So they're kind of pulling attention to it like look how cool I am and they do flips and stunts and tricks um, and uh, the they're also for hire but because when when he's hired he has to disclose because of the obligators that he's actually only a coin shot but everyone thinks he's a misborn he's a lot more affordable than a misborn so like if anyone needs to get something done, they can be like they can hire him and he can go intimidate like a mistborn, but he's like way cheaper, he's like half the price. <laughs> and depending on what day of the week it is, you might uh -huh. get the family discount for a quarter of the price. <laughs> he'll bring he'll bring his son who is who is a lurcher who can pull metal and he just puts his son in a backpack <laughs> and he'll just jump around his and they'll work in tandem. See? <laughs> yes, that's good. Now here's where. Uh, <clears throat> so we got affordable. All right. So he's uh, he charges you know d d discounted price than what normal misborns do. We found aerobatic. Uh -huh. He's he's got sweet stunts, sweet flips. Yeah. Now uh, he's known. <laughs> I don't want to make this joke, but I really I'm going to make this joke and then move on to uh -huh. what I want to say. He really okay. likes insane clown posse, so he always carries a hatchet. <laughs> but that's not. <laughs> we're not gonna every do time, that. every time he does something sweet, he goes whoop whoop just to see if anyone else gets it. <laughs> and about a uh, a two hundred and thirty second of the time, there's at least uh -huh. one person. But <laughs> there's uh, one person like whoop whoop. They just so raise the their hatchet joke. hand into the hatchet sky. <laughs> that's the bad joke. The real joke is that uh, he that's his weapon of choice is a hatchet. And it's an all-metal hatchet, which is pretty dangerous, you know, seeing as though he may encounter some other Mistborns who could do even sweeter stunts and flips. But uh -huh. he prefers this hatchet that his grandfather gave him. Uh, his grandfather, a Mistborn, gave to him in hopes that one day he would be a Mistborn. Although he just, mm -hmm. just turned out to be a coin shot, which is a little, you know, disappointing. Because <laughs> his grandfather really wanted him to be a Mistborn. But, you know, he, he's trying to fight each day. As though he's not a disappointment to his entire family. So, what is this character doing during the during the story? Other than like like, so he he's made a name for himself as being a mistborn when really he's just a coin shot. Um, and and just the few that have hired him know that. Um, he has a son that's a lurcher. Can I just say that he has like eight children? Each one of them have like a different alimantic power. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So he's not a mistborn, but like his whole family in one body would be a mistborn with their powers combined uh -huh. <laughs> so uh he he's got his hatchet he's jumping around uh wh what is he doing I'm, I'm gonna say that he is uh he's actually trying to kill all mistborn so that he can ratchet up his prices and then like hey everyone will be on an even playing field mistborn or two op and so that's his specialty that hatchet that he has obsidian but there's Ooh, a little yeah. piece 
there's there's a little piece where he can put a metal coin into so he can actually push the whole hatchet at someone but the uh if they try to push back on it the coin flies out and the hatchet keeps going so that's how he's Good. taken out a lot of Mistborn with his with his special hatchet and with his sweet tr- tricks and stunts cuz he cuz he practices all the time um when normal Mistborn are like maybe resting on their laurels like oh I'm good enough I don't need to, to practice that much yeah this yeah and he he would he would definitely be a, the and an, an, at least one antagonist in the story that uh-huh. with with whom Kelsier has a pretty wicked awesome fight and maybe Kelsier, you know, is fighting him, and he's like, ah, I can't get a good shot on this guy. Uh, and then he thinks he finds him, but what he does find is actually three of his kids, and all of them are burning uh-huh. metals, and all of them have hatchets. And they're like, whoop, whoop. <laughs> They're all burning different metals. He's, he's like, I, I thought he was burning tin and, and pewter, and then the pewter arm kid comes up behind him, and I'm going to say the pewter arm kid's like four years old, but he's a very strong four-year-old. He's just very, takes that very hatchet. strong. He raises that hatchet hand, goes whoop whoop, tries to bring it down on on Kelsier, and Kelsier's like, "Dude, is this a family enterprise? I'm getting out of here." And he tries to leave, but he can't. He's he's stuck. He's he's trapped by by all of his kids, and uh, like maybe maybe Kelsier, uh, maybe okay. I'm gonna say that this character, uh, this this, oh, it's gonna be a father. This father. Um, he idolizes Kelsier, the survivor of Hath Sin. So when he finally Ooh, finds yeah. him, he doesn't want to take him out because the survivor is, you know, doing other stuff. He's he knows that he is trying to bring down the the government itself. And he's like, all right, well, that's going to mean more Mistborn gone. That's fine with me. Also, Kelsier's probably going to get himself killed anyway. Well, and so, like, when he, <laughs> it's well, maybe maybe it won't happen, but uh, he thinks it's going to happen, and he. Uh, and so he's like, he's like, you know, I'm going to let this guy go. I'm going to, I'm not going to let my, my hatchet kids hatchet him to death this time. (laughs) (laughs) And so he picks up all of his children on different pouches on his clothing and then jumps off into the night. (laughs) I feel like he would be a good, uh, a good recurring character in, Mm. in every couple chapters. Where, you know, Kelsier has to, like, check up on him to see if he's, you know, spilled the beans at all. I think this uh-huh. guy would be a pretty uh, a pretty good asset to the to the, the rebellion, to the revolution. Yeah. And uh, I think he'd also... I'm going to throw this out there. He's really good friends with Breeze. He and Breeze, oh, okay. you know, they, I think they're great buds. And so he has a uh-huh. certain haughty air to him that mm-hmm. uh he kind of, he really picked up from you know spending so much time from breeze but as a nobleman he's he's in, i don't want to say entitled to but more than likely he's going to have and so he and breeze can have some witty banter sessions uh-huh he's I, he's I the lucille great. too to breeze's lucille oh ben i love this so much he's now, here's lucille ostero he is lucille ostero and he has vertigo uh-huh. Absolutely, has vertigo. <laughs> so I all the last thing we need for this for this character is like uh, he's been doing all this stuff uh, yeah. through the uh, through the nobleman, and I think he's been you know taking lots of uh, because the house war starting. He's been getting lots of moolah, taking lots of jobs, probably hiding oh, some yeah. of his kids outside of the uh, outside of the city. Um, Mister Pewter Arm is is probably hidden. And uh, we just, I think we just need a name for this character. What's his name? We do. Uh, how about this? I give a first name. You okay. give a, you give a middle name. I give a second or a, yeah, second middle name. And then you give the last name. Okay. He I seems want... like a guy who would have four names. Okay. Uh, think, think of a, think of your name and I'll think of my name and then we'll count to three and we'll say it at the same time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Uh, okay. I got it. Okay. Three. Two, one, Birkins. Bertrold. Bertrold Birkins? <laughs> Wait, can that be his first and last name? <laughs> you know what? I yeah, I just want that. that was really Bertrold, Bertrold Birkins. Birkins. <laughs> Everyone his kids uh spread rumors that uh, he's the flying BB. You know, because like uh-huh. a little BB is metal and he's misborn. <laughs> He's the flying BB, which brings <laughs> yes, back to that's... aerobatic. Thank you. Yeah, he and and I maybe he like he has like some some uh, some connection to like like uh, you know Dick Grayson was in in the uh, 
in the circus. Maybe he has some connection to the circus. Like that's where Ooh, he got yeah. his start. And uh, yeah, he's he's the flying BB. He's Birchall Birkins. <laughs> the the affordable hatchet aerobatic. <laughs> MD. MD. He's a doctor. He's a doctor. Uh, you know, he, he he's he's a doctor of death. He knows how to deliver uh, it. Ooh, yeah. This is a great this is a great character. Um Mr. Sanderson, if you want to rewrite Mistborn with this character in it, we wouldn't be mad. We wouldn't be mad. We would not even charge you anything. Um just make sure that Bertrold Birkins is his name. Please. And Please. if you introduce Insane Clown Posse into the universe, um, just have us as the lead singers instead of the other, instead of Murder Boy and Axe Hound, the, the other ones. <laughs> the other ones. <laughs> that was great. Bertrold Birkins for the win. MD. Bertrold Birkins. I love him. I love him. I love him I too. He's, he's a great person. He, and his sweet little kids, all of them, all of them so precious and sweet and so murdery with all of their little hatchets. So murdery. Did we say, did we say there's eight of them? Uh, there's seven, and he's the eighth. That's right. That's right. There's seven of them. Yeah. Ah, oh, so cute. And when they fly into yep. the sky, it's like ET with all the kids flying over the moon. He just—it's <laughs> perfect. They just—they just all fly in, and they all f- fall apart. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay because the pewter arms running on the ground, and he catches them all. I uh, no, I—they're I, all wearing like metal belts. The lurcher is just pulling them back constantly. Just. <laughs> <laughs> his his firstborn is the lurcher, the the one that can pull on metal, and he's just constantly trying to keep these guys in like Spider Man. <laughs> guys, this is All a beautiful right. family. It's a beautiful family. You know, it's and beautiful. and they make it work, even though things are hard. They make it work, and they have they fun do. together. You'll you'll never see a happier family. Yeah, man, this is a beautiful Birkins. family. Well, uh, this has been this has been a really fun episode, you guys. I had uh-huh. a lot of fun. Did you have fun? Please tell us by following us on our new Facebook page, Brandon Sander Fans with Ben and Sam. Leave a comment, uh-huh. follow, like our page, tell your friends to like it. You can also mm-hmm. follow us on Twitter at, at the Sander Fans. That's where we announce our new episodes. Uh, sometimes we tweet stuff about Brandon Sanderson when there's like, you know, every once in a while, either Amazon or some other book places will have deals. Uh, we'll always uh-huh. let you know about that. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. It is at Samuel underscore loose. And Ben, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter is best uh, at Ben Parrish B N N P A R R I S H, and they can find Grayson on your Instagram, Sam. Just, just chilling out and and being a co-host to the Brandon yes, Sanders fans with good, Ben Sam and Grayson. He's a good little co-host. He uh, he he let some very appropriate growls out during this period during this uh, this podcast. So yeah. let's uh, let's give it up for Grayson. He's he's the mastermind behind the show. I'll, I'll add in well, a sound effect of people clapping right here of applause. Yes, thank you. That is so good. <laughs> Grayson, do you hear that? That applause, that future applause is for you. Oh, oh, wait, I forgot the applause. Let me add it in here. Oh, no, I, f- I forgot again. Oh, I can't find it. Never mind. That's okay. You know, that's you, okay. That's okay. You he tried. Doesn't, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't need the encouragement. He's eight months old. What does he need? He just needs food. I love you, Grayson. There, that's encouraging. Sam, Sam thank he doesn't you guys. need that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you Brandon Sander fan addicts for listening uh, I don't know Ben is there anything else we need to say um, just the last thing that we say before we end every episode until oh, yeah. next time read a book read a book <laughs> Oh man.